A few years ago, I saw a post on social media, and it said, $200 grocery card to give to a family in need, making less than $200,000 a year. Send us your story telling us why you feel you need it, and we'll pick someone. Please raise your hand if you feel this is a wonderful gesture of giving. My name is Sohaila Smith, and I'd like to talk to you today about need and the art of giving, no strings attached. Need is an interesting word. Often when we think about need, we think of it from a more privileged perspective, as in the less fortunate. But that doesn't encompass the diversity of human need. Need can mean many things to many people. It can mean food, courage, confidence, money, shelter, love, companionship, a sense of belonging, respect, a voice, and a reason. I could go on, but regardless of the kind of need, every need is valid, and we all need something. Let's go back in time for a second. <laughs> Six months before I saw this post, I felt need. And you're probably thinking the same thing I was. How could I possibly feel need? I have clothes on my back, a roof over my head, food on my table, I have a job, the bills are getting paid as best my husband and I were able to. But I still felt need. In this world where we're constantly bombarded by what we need and what we think we need, the needs are very quickly blurred with the wants, and I was having trouble seeing in perspective. I felt I had not enough. Not enough time, not enough love, not enough money, not enough to help myself and my family, let alone to help someone else. Speaking of family, as I sat there suffocating in the feeling of not enough, I thought of something my mother told me. Back in the 80s when the recession hit, my dad lost his business, and our family lost our home, and my mother had to go back to work after raising four kids to help with the finances. And according to her, she would take the last $15 after the bills were paid, to buy rice and beans to feed my family of six for a week. Now, my mom is an amazing storyteller, so it's possible the details are a little fudged, but <laughs> the, effect, the effectiveness was there. And uh, when my brain said, you have nothing, I said, no, I have so much more than I realize. When you feel you're least able to, and that you have not enough, is exactly when you should give, so that you can see how much you really have. All you have to do is open your eyes. So I thought, OK, if I have so much, what do I have? I have skills. I've got lots of skills, I like to think. I've got time. I wasn't working as much as I wanted to. I have energy. I'm a workaholic, and I can admit that. And I have love. But what am I genuinely good at that's actually useful to other people? Music, art, cooking. I thought of something. When I was a kid, my mom used to bake banana loaves. And they always brought me comfort. So I decided to bake banana bread and give it away on a pay it forward group that I created for the community. Four loaves very quickly turned into 12 to 16 loaves weekly. And everyone that received was as happy to receive them as I was to bake them. Through this really simple gesture, I realized there is always more than enough to give. More so, I realized I had so much more to offer. I was empowered by giving without expectation. So let's go back to the social media post. There's no car this time. Uh, when I saw this post, and I saw the, the list of praising comments, I really couldn't help myself. Keep in mind, I made less than this income bracket that was specified, and I was in a bad mindset. But I, I looked at it and I said, no, this isn't giving. When you limit entitlement to a gift by an income bracket, and you ask people to publicly disclose their personal struggles, their financial details, their hardships on social media, and then you ask them to justify the reason for their need for this necessity, food, that is the farthest thing from giving. It is not giving. In fact, it's demeaning and it's dehumanizing. So all I could think of was, if my mom can take $15 and feed our family of six for a week, I should be able to feed at least 40 people with $100. So I decided to take my grocery money that fed my family for three to five days, my family of three, and stretch it to feed an additional 35 people. And so came the birth of Soup House. Soup House is a place that has served two, sorry, 102 suppers to date. Uh, it's a place where tables are set, candles are lit, volunteers are our waiters, uh, guests are all welcome to like, and we serve nutritious suppers every single Tuesday. 
It's a place where everyone is welcome to come to get what they need as long as we can provide it without compromising their privacy. So this is just the idea. There had to be more to it. I specifically chose the word complementary because the word free tends to mean something discarded, unwanted, or of lesser value. But complementary comes along with a welcome message that says, please join us. And I thought, OK, let's serve a side order of respect with this and offer a sit-down dinner instead, instead of takeout, and help people longer term by providing a giving table where they can take things like freshly baked loaves, produce grown in the garden, and local uh, non-perishables from local supporting bodies, such as schools or the food bank. Now, with any idea, there has to be some structure. One, give what you love. Give what brings you joy. If I have to ask for it, it's not giving. And if it's a burden to you, it's not really giving. The way I look at it is this. If you do what you love, it's not work. And if your work gives you what you love, it's not a burden. It's much more sustainable to do something long term if you enjoy it. Two, no expectations and no obligations. This means that every single volunteer is under no obligation and has no, we have no expectation of them to give beyond what they're comfortable with. This means that sometimes we'll have one volunteer, that's my son, on the day that we had one volunteer. <laughs> Just for context, he's seven and he served 20 people. Um, and other days, we have many volunteers. Number three, guests are guests, not clients. This means we're not gonna collect data. We're not gonna find out where they live or how much money they make or why they're coming. If you were coming to my house for dinner, I would never ask you how much money you make or to fill out your name and address on a piece of paper for my records. I would never question why you needed to eat my food at all. I would simply welcome you, make sure that you felt welcomed. I would offer you supper, probably forcefully offer you seconds, and I would be more than anything happy that you joined me. This is the element of soup house, the element of equality and respect that soup house instills. When you remove the structure of financial division or class structure, whatever you want to call it, and everyone is welcome at the table, regardless of who they are, what their life is like, what their religion is, what their origin is, just human beings at the table together, something amazing happens. You reestablish a sense of community. Four, no strings attached policy. We have a no strings attached policy for both giving and receiving. This means that when someone offers us a gift, but they tack on a condition, we're not necessarily obligated to fulfill that request, nor are we necessarily willing to accept that gift. But it also means that when we give, we give without expectation of anything in return. You see, when you give with strings, it's not really giving. Giving with an expectation, it's a trade, a transaction, or a deal. You, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. That's not, that's not giving, it's barter. Now, sometimes people have difficulty accepting a gift, and this is something we had to take into account. So people have self-imposed guilt. Who, who here feels uncomfortable receiving a gift? There's probably a lot of you, yeah, okay. So uh, basically, when someone feels uncomfortable or feels that self-imposed guilt or the need that would make them happy to give back, they're welcome to, so long as they do it discreetly in a way that does not make anyone else who may not be in a similar position feel obligated to do the same. So with these founding rules in place, I found a location graciously willing to offer their space to us. And I had to put up a social media post that said, we're starting to serve weekly suppers every Tuesday. If you'd like to volunteer or join us for dinner, please do. And they came. The very first night, supper was ready, volunteers were dressed in aprons, tables were set, candles were lit, music was playing, the guests arrived, and we served them. And as the weeks went on, we had more guests and more volunteers and more support from the local community, local businesses, local schools, and the food bank. The community initiative was in full swing, people helping people. Sounds almost perfect, but let's talk money. How do you feed 35 people with $100? It seemed kind of impossible at first. So, I mean, that would mean that on weeks when I had more, let's say $150, and I'm not very good at math, um, it would be two to three dollars per person for a two to three course meal. And on weeks when I made less money, so $100 roughly, it would be $1.50 to $2 per person. It seemed impossible, but it just took a little bit of creativity. 
And I'm an artist, which explains both my slightly lower income bracket, but also my source of creativity that makes this possible. I had to learn through trial and error how to stretch the money and the food to feed the people, a nutritious, wholesome meal that was also satisfying. Now, there's a much steeper learning curve when you do anything like this. The first lesson that I learned was, not everyone's going to like what you give them. <laughs> Just because you give it doesn't mean they're going to like it. Your ego has to go out the window. All I'm going to say is keto avocado sugar-free chocolate mousse wasn't a hit. <laughs> Number two, there, when you have something pure and good, like genuinely pure and good, there will always be someone who tries to manipulate it for their advantage, whether it be financial gain or administrative gain. And unfortunately, we have had a few instances where something like this has occurred, where someone has given us something and then later on tacked on a condition that they felt we were therefore obligated to fulfill. But because of our privacy policy and our no strings attached policy, this does cause conflict. When you give with an expectation of something in return, that is business. And even a charity is a business, which takes me to my next point. People always say, you need to register Soup House as a charity. But that would turn our guests into clients, and that won't do. Funny enough, though, we realized we need something from our guests. We need reservations. After running out of food twice over the past two years, we, we don't really need to know why they're there, who they are, where they live, or what, what their situation is. We literally just need to know that they're coming so we know how many bellies we're filling. This helps us prevent food waste, financial waste, and helps us prepare for the labor of love ahead, otherwise known as work. But, despite needing to know this number, we're always prepared for at least five walk-ins. New guests who don't know to reserve, guests who aren't able to reserve for whatever reason, emergency situations, and the homeless. And yes, all of the above have graced our tables, and each and every one of them was served alike. With any idea, there's always a challenger. In this case, there's a parable that says, you feed a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, and he eats for a lifetime. The point of it being that by providing for people, we're fostering dependence, and we're not really helping them. So I thought about this. I'm a pretty, a pretty level-headed person, and I gave it some serious thought. And I thought, yes, we definitely feed them. And yes, we definitely provide for them. But a lot of our guests will stay after supper to help clear up. Or they'll come back and volunteer for a day to give back themselves. Some of them bring gifts of produce so that we can cook the meals, and others are so thoughtful that they bring treats to share on the giving table with all of the other guests. We also educate people on proper food portions, healthy food choices, and we make cultural meals accessible to them that they may not have ever tried before. We do a lot more than just feed people. We don't foster dependence. We foster good humans by setting a good example. I realized something. I need help. It's not that kind of help, though. I'm one person, and I can only do so much. I have the idea, I have the modest finances to make it happen, the drive, but I can't serve all the guests. I need the help of the volunteers. And I can't manage all of the tasks on a regular basis every single week on my own. So Josh helps me. And I can't run a team of volunteers while simultaneously plating 35 suppers. But Brenda helps. This list could go on literally all night long. But to stay on point, I'll say that I could not do what I do without the help of every single person involved in every aspect of Soup House. And for each and every one of them, I am extremely grateful. One person can do a lot of good. But many people working together can do amazing things exponentially. But what's the catch? Why do you do it? What's in it for you? What do you get out of it? Joy? Happiness? The good feeling that comes from helping others? See, fulfillment is often defined by how much money we have or the value of the things that we've acquired in our life. But my bucket is filled when I do what I love, and I fill your bucket while doing it. There is no need for strings in a relationship that is naturally and mutually symbiotic. It's not about money, and it's not about things. It's values-based. Instead of looking at each other and measuring each other up based on how much more or less you have, 
Try looking at each other like human beings with just as much to give as you and just as much need as you as well. If you take away something from today, take away that expectation is the enemy of a gift. It destroys the gift. True fulfillment comes from giving what you love, free from burden, and without expectation. Now that's some food for thought. Thank you.